All right. So I'm going to be talking about, like Ellen said, uh, the effect of a, 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 a parent skill training, uh, particularly for um, the outcomes and treatment for suicidal adolescents. Um, like Ellen explained really well and walked us through really nicely, individual functioning and family functioning are you know, inevitably connected. When one person is suffering, when one person is having a hard time, that impacts the family system. And of course, as the family becomes burdened, um, as uh, Perry uh, nicely talked about, then that impacts individual functioning as well. Um, and Alan walked us through this process, so I'll just, uh, uh, oh, let's go back. Um, and so well, one thing that we do know is that, um, and most of us spend this, our time doing this, is that people with severe emotion dysregulation, personality disorders, um, suicidal, they need help. And DBT um, is one of the, uh, the treatments that, you know, is widely used. And it's been adapted for uh, suicidal adolescents, um, uh, adolescents who have multiple problems. And DBT... Uh, when it's delivered in uh, for suicidal ad adolescents, it includes a number of different uh, aspects of intervention. Uh, one of them is individual therapy, uh, skills group where they're learning skills, and in most programs for adolescents in particular, that can can be the form as a multifamily skills group where parents um, join for uh, learning skills as well. Uh, they also get skills coaching and consultation to the therapist. And evidence that we know uh, is suggesting that this is an effective treatment both in outpatient and uh, 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 some studies now on uh, residential settings. And we also know that family members need help as well. Um, family members, they are often required to manage situations that they are very ill-prepared to manage. They don't know what to do. In fact, that's one of the things that we hear most uh, in uh, family connections groups is that they have no idea what to do. They really want to be helpful. They really want uh, to help their family member. They just don't know how. Uh, and they end up in the front line of services. They are case managers. They are crisis intervention uh, people. They are sort of, um, you know, in these several roles uh, that, of course, they did not have any training for. And, uh, and, and in general, families have uh, a lack of access to services. Uh, but for suicidal adolescents in particular, and sometimes when they end up in residential treatment settings, um, they really have very few um, resources. And then when we look into treatment, um, even though Parents can sometimes be included, family members can be included in, in the treatment. It is in a very limited capacity. Uh, so what we end up seeing is that family members, they uh, report high levels of burden, distress, grief, uh, and as Perry walked us through, uh, uh, stress and trauma-related problems. Uh, they have low abilities to manage those difficulties. They don't feel like uh, they, they uh, know what to do. They don't feel empowered to know what to do. Um, and so one thing that uh, both Perry and Alan have dedicated a lot of their time for is uh, 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 teaching families how to do this. And we know that without improving uh, family functioning, um, Problems can be created or are exacerbated uh, over time. As Alan walked us through the, the, the transactional model, we see that pervasive history of invalidation. So as these transactions happen over and over and over, then families get burdened. Um, the, the, uh, our patients, they get more distressed, and uh, we get stuck into this process. So um, I'll just go, since Alan talked so much about this, in the interest of time, I will be... Um, so talking about this transactional model, so this um, idea that when we are dysregulated, we express ourselves more inaccurately, and that makes it more likely for somebody to uh, be invalidating. So um, a patient will uh, express their anger, uh, blame the parent, and the parent might uh, in turn say, you know, uh, this is your fault, or, you know, do something that is invalidating. And on the other hand, uh, when emotions are lower, the person is better able to express themselves accurately and then therefore get a more validating response. So 
when uh, one thing that uh, we are doing with our patients is helping them regulate their emotions, teaching them skills, and teaching them ways to um, to be able to express themselves in a way that is more accurate, which should make it easier for parents to be more validating, for family members to be more validating. Uh, and as parents are better at validating, then um, they can uh, the uh, uh, adolescents and patients can more accurately express themselves. Um, so. What we, we, uh, we want to focus on doing is then treating both sides of this transaction. So treatment for patients and adolescents uh, in DBT, you're teaching them skills to be able to regulate their emotions and communicate more effectively. And when we include parents, like in multifamily skills group or family therapy, one of the things that is focused on is teaching parents how to be more validating, how to manage problems more effectively. Now, one of the problems is that if we think about just how much these parents are suffering, uh, just how difficult it is for them to be able to manage their own distress, the question is just pulling the families in there in the context of family therapy or in the context of a family skills group where the adolescent and the patient is with them, um, is, that, is that really enough? Uh, because we, we can see that with parent functioning, as the parents are more distressed, it might be harder for them to regulate their own emotions and be able to utilize the skills that we're trying to teach them to do. So um, to bridge some of this gap, um, uh, there's the Family Connections Program that is now widely available in, um, in, 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 in many different countries. And what the Family Connections Program tries to do is help families in learn skills, uh, get psychoeducation about suicidal behavior, borderline personality disorder, and also provide families with social support. So we're getting this other side of the, 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 this other side of the family, right? We're treating the patient, now we're going to treat the family as well and we're teaching them how to manage their own distress and how to be more validating. And Family Connections has uh, several published studies, and what we find in all of the studies is that is effective in reducing burden, reducing grief, uh, and increasing parents' or family members' ability to uh, respond in ways that are uh, more helpful. They feel empowered uh, in, in how they're responding. One thing that we don't have in any of these studies is any indication of how this might, uh, parents learn these skills, how that might impact the patient themselves. So uh, w the model, right, suggests that while well, these parents are learning skills, they're becoming more validating, they're regulating their emotions, so this is gonna have some sort of impact on the patients. And so far we didn't have any studies to, um, uh, to look at what the impact of teaching skills and intervening with the families might have on the patients. So that's what we set out to do. Uh, and what we did was we went into a residential treatment facility that was offering full uh, model DBT um, for suicidal, chronically suicidal, multi-problem adolescents. And the program offered comprehensive DBT, so individual uh, therapy. They also had family therapy uh, once a week, so they were already getting some kind of family intervention, even though they were in residential treatment. And this is an important piece to remember as I go through. Uh, they were getting skills group and skills coaching and, of course, the consultation to the therapist. So this was an adherent um, DBT program. And we recruited 112 adolescents who uh, uh, participated in the residential program. There were mostly females, three males. Uh, the average age of the participants was 15. Um, and the average duration of treatment that they were in the residential treatment center was 12 weeks. Um, and so what we did, because, um, and, and this is an important piece as well, that Family Connections is available widely, but in one place that it's not very often that we find is in, 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 in clinics, in places that we are offering um, uh, treatment for the adolescents. So we got the Family Connections curriculum. We condensed it into an intensive two-day training. 
uh, and delivered in this residential treatment setting for the parents. So we tailored the curriculum that also included psychoeducation, skills training, and social support. We tailored it to meet the needs of family members or parents uh, of kids who are in residential treatment. But the meat of it was um, uh, essentially what we try to do with family connections over a two-day period. So these are families. So these kids were in residential treatment. These are families that are geographically distant. We spent some time trying to figure out how do we get these families involved? And uh, our best solution was let's, you know, let's do a weekend. Let's get everybody fly into town. They do sort of a, a, a family skills boot camp. Uh, they're here with us for two full days and uh, we'll see what we get. So. Uh, the skills that we focus on um, is both uh, individual self-management. So these are what we call mini DBT skills. We're teaching them skills in regulating their own emotions, uh, interpersonal effectiveness skills, and self-validations. One of the things that we find families do a lot is there's a lot of guilt, a lot of self-blame, a lot of self-invalidation. And then we focus on family skills. So this is the part where we teach them a lot of validation, relationship mindfulness, reactivating their relationship with their kids, um, acceptance, and problem management skills. So uh, uh, the procedure for the study. So uh, when adolescents were admitted into the residential program, uh, they completed the first packet of assessment within the first two weeks. And the reason why we uh, did it within the first two weeks, we wanted them to be settled. We didn't want to do it on day one. We wanted to give us some time for them to sort of settle into the program uh, and, uh, and then complete the assessment. And then they were randomly assigned for their family to either participate in the family skills program right away or to be waitlisted. We used a waitlist design uh, because, of course, we didn't want to withhold the treatment from anybody. Um, so we figured we'll have uh, one group uh, go right away and the other group will wait and we will use them as a comparison. Um, so uh, following their parents' attendance and family skills training, uh, the adolescents completed another set of questionnaires uh, that was roughly about six to nine weeks from their time of being admitted into the program. And then the waitlist uh, group had the opportunity to participate in family skills training. And uh, the week prior to discharge, adolescents completed um, uh, uh, some questionnaires as well. And for, for this particular study, what we were interested in looking at is both how um, uh, individual outcomes, so how teens were improving in the program, and also family outcomes. How are we making a difference here both in their family uh, dynamics and uh, in the outcomes that were interested for the teenagers, which was emotion regulation measured by the DERS and uh, depression in particular, we used the DAS, and then we used the validation and validation response scales and the, uh, uh, the LEAP, which is a measure of emotional availability of parents. And here's what we found. So um, for validation first, we found that once parents attended family skills, four weeks later, so this was at the end of the randomized period, so this is just four weeks after parent attendance in the program, and keep in mind, these are families, everybody was uh, receiving family therapy as well. Uh, the good news is that everybody improved in validation, but uh, parents who participated in the family skills training were rated by their adolescents as being more validating than parents who attended, uh, who were in the waitlist group. Invalidation also went in the right direction for both groups, so there was some reduction of invalidation. Um, this difference between the, the family skills group and the waitlist group is not significant, but you can see it's like trending in the right direction. And emotional availability, this is how their adolescence is perceiving that they can go to their parents and talk to them about things that are important to them um, about it, and feel like they're going to be accepted and understood. Um, what we found, of course, it went in the right direction in both groups, but family, con family uh, skills training was, uh, had a significant better uh, improvement than in the waitlist control group. And the difference at time one is not significant. Yep. 
And then the other part that we wanted to take a look at. So we talk about this transactional model of, you know, this, this influence between being emotionally dysregulated and invalidation response. So we wanted to see. So adolescents are getting more uh, regulated. They're learning skills and regulate their emotions. Parents are learning to be more validating. Are we finding that these two things are connected? So what uh, we did was get the validation and invalidation scores from time one, uh, subtracted from time three. So what we're looking for is how they, this, those scores change. So the improvement from uh, the time when they were admitted to the time when they were discharged. And remember, this is their adolescence rating on the parents. And uh, we entered the time one scores first as a covariate, and then the validation and invalidation scores were entered simultaneously in the regression. And what we found is that parent uh, validating responses predicted about 35% of the variance um, of how adolescents uh, regulated their emotions at the time of discharge. So if you think about this, all adolescents were improving. Their, their emotion regulation ability was improved, and 36% of that, of that improvement can be accounted for by how the parents were uh, improved in their ability to validate uh, their children. And then we looked at depression, and we found similar, uh, similar outcomes. 34% of the variance can be accounted by par parent improvement in validating responses. And then finally, because we had uh, that wait list control group and this was a residential treatment setting, it turns out that some families just weren't able to make it to, uh, to the family skills training uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, at first we were worried that is this going to be the families that are struggling the most uh, or is this the families that are more chaotic or is there a socioeconomic uh, piece there for why families weren't able to attend. But there were no significant differences between the group that was able to attend than the one that wasn't. About 20% of the sample did not um, ultimately make it into a family skills group. So we had this uh, other comparison group that we could look at uh, in family skills versus no family skills. Uh, so basically what we did here, um, if you remember, the wait list had an opportunity to attend family skills uh, later in treatment. Um, and so we combined the, uh, the group that attended early with the group that attended later uh, and, uh, and uh, compared those to the ones that didn't attend at all. The only difference that we found for the group that did not attend at all is that mothers seemed to be more validating than t for the parents who did attend, which was uh, surprising to me because, you know, one of the things that is often talked about is uh, these families are too chaotic or these families are not interested in learning. And of course, what we found is that parents un universally, they said, please, offer this and offer this more. Um, but it, it, there's some indication there that perhaps the families that already have some of those skills were the ones that weren't able to make it. Um, and, um, and what we were uh, specifically interested with uh, in this comparison is how attending family connections at all during the treatment um, impacted the kids' outcomes, so treatment outcomes, looking at their ability to regulate emotions at discharge. Um, and what we found is a significant difference between the families that attended family skills to the families that did not attend family skills. So the importance of uh, the, uh, this result over here is that all of these kids, so the, this reduction is significant for both groups, but when parents, when families are involved in the treatment, their kids are benefiting more and significantly more than when parents are not involved in the treatment. And uh, we did not find any significant differences for depression um, in this question. So just to summarize, adolescents whose parents attended family connection or family skills training, um, they showed better treatment outcomes and parents had more validating um, responses and, more, and they were more emotionally available as rated by their teens above and beyond what was uh, predicted or achieved by comprehensive DBT, which is an important piece. So, you know, going back into this idea of individual functioning and family functioning, um, 
it seems like uh, some of the studies that, you know, that what Alan talked about and the evidence of the studies that when we focus only on our patients, on, on the adolescents, we can get some great outcomes. But when we pull the family in uh, and we provide resources for these parents who are, of course, suffering as well and they have their own set of difficulties, we're able to um, uh, change family functioning in a way where both sides are improving the individual functioning of both patients and parents, and then ultimately we are uh, improving the family functioning as a whole. Uh, some future directions. Um, of course, we need to uh, uh, replicate and expand uh, these results. I'd be specifically interested in seeing how this um, plays out in um, outpatient settings as most um, uh, programs, um, especially DBT programs, don't necessarily offer any resources for families. Um, and uh, understand more the mechanisms through which uh, uh, family skills lead to uh, treatment outcomes for teens and parents and potentially as a moderator of outcome, does it make a difference if we intervene earlier in treatment, later in treatment? Alan has some results there that earlier might make more sense. Um, do we need to provide more support? Is there like a dosage effect in this? Is the two days enough? Um, kind of question. And also uh, family structure and parental involvement uh, in the sample in the study, the family constellation was varied. There were single family homes, uh, dual parent homes, uh, divorced families with that had remarried, um, and the number of people who were able to attend, uh, of course, varied. So um, uh, that level of parental involvement um, would also be interesting to look at. And other processes, other family transactions that might predict um, outcome. Thank you. Okay, I think we have about five to seven minutes. We, if you have anybody have any questions for any of us, yeah, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, I wasn't very um, the, uh, were they, Well, this is a side question, but were they parental pairs, your own mother, father? In for right? Lucy. In, in, in this study, yeah. Well, that, say that again, I'm sorry? Were they all parent, was it a parental pair, mother, father? Uh, or was it just variable huh. that you had some who just mum who came, some who parents, so father came, we, some? The, the program was available for all parents. Yeah. And what we did, we had the kids rate, uh, they had one rating for their mother and one rating for their father. Um, and for the analyses, we actually combined oh, um, all of their fun. ratings. So it's around um, the parental rate. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and the reason we did that is because for some, for, it was usually the case that one parent could attend on the randomized date and the other one attended at a different time, or sometimes only one parent could because the other one was busy at home taking care of other children or, you know, well, like those like things. Around, right, about similar, but we haven't got the outcomes of the BBD. I think that's excellent. But that's what I was going to ask you, because you had them for three months in the, in the residential facility. Mm -hmm. Did any of this affect the outcomes of that residential treatment in the individual? Did you have that? I mean, in terms of the family interaction process, you've obviously got a difference, but the actual treatment that you were delivering over that three months. Did it change the treatment itself? Uh, no. I mean, could you or change the outcome? Change the outcome of that treatment in any way. So that's what we saw in the comparison of uh, the families that, were att that attended family skills and the ones that did not attend. What we found is that for the ones when parents did attend, the kids had better ability to regulate their emotions. Yeah, but that wasn't the aim of that residential treatment, presumably. And was it? Was that the only aim, right? Well, that's the, that's the putative mediator, right, in DBT is, is, is emotion regulation. And then outcomes, I mean, the thing is that the, the follow-up outcomes need to be things like self-harm. You know, you know, they're not self-harming while they're in the residential program, it, you know. That's right. These are afterwards, but I just wondered if the baseline at the end was any different. Right, exactly, and there was, you know, we couldn't look at suicide attempts or, you know, self-harm and that kind of stuff, because those things are not happening. Essentially zero while they're there. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Makes a lot of sense to me to work with a family. Um, something I'm puzzled about uh, is whether your PTSD info includes whether there was sexual abuse by a parent, and if it was, uh, how does validation when that's the 
<laughs> Wait, so is that for my yeah. for my data? Can can you? I thought you was asking for Carrie. Can, well, can if, you repeat? If, if there was sexual abuse by a parent, were they included in that that How would the accommodation look like? Yeah, I don't. I'd, I'd, we I don't think we had that information. Um, we we did. Well, we, we did. In what? Uh, uh, Sorry, the, 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 there are almost no parents involved in this who were perpetrators. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's all. That's all what she's asking. So, uh, of course, in treatment, if if one were a perpetrator, of course, that would require you know uh, uh, validation would have many different dimensions. Uh, okay, uh, let's just say, uh, you know. Uh, uh, it's a long thing, but the, the, uh, for, for purposes of Lucy's data and my data, uh, the, the perpetrating parents are rare, uh, rarely, if ever, in fact, I think not involved at all. The perpetrating parents don't come in to participate in this. These are the other parent or, or you know, in most, you know, we all you know, vary, rates vary, but parent perpetrators are, are rates are relatively low. Um, uh, I'd like to believe that. I'm, um, really, really curious about why we're not talking about incest more. Why we're not talking about? This isn't specific to you yeah. at all. Usually it's hidden <coughs> in the data under the heading of PTSD and completely ignored. And maybe you don't need to talk about it. In my clinical experience, you do. So I'm kind of puzzled about that. Well, there are a lot of things going on in treatment that we, we aren't addressing here. So if there was childhood sexual abuse, it would be part of treatment, of course. I would say that would be a routine part of treatment. That just didn't happen to be part of, you know, uh, and I think you looked at PCL scores as well. Do you remember what, what did you find there? Um, so the, the, the adolescents typically had a high PCL score, so in the in, in the 40s to 60s, most of them. What we did find, that they, PTSD wasn't targeted specifically uh, in treatment when they were in residential uh, with us, um, but uh, their PCL scores reduced um, significantly. I mean, they were still it was it still remained a target of treatment after residential, mostly because the the I guess one of the key pieces of of uh, of that program in particular was just stabilizing. They were suicidal. They were coming in for multiple suicide attempts and, and, uh, and self-injury. So we're just stabilizing them and getting them into an outpatient treatment. But to answer your question just a little more directly, for example, in our current program, I, I run a program for boys, um, about 25% have experienced sexual trauma. Um, it's rarely from a parent, um, quite rarely. Um, but we address it in treatment, um, and it's, if we don't address it in treatment, it's uh, the, the, the evidence in both the, the girls' program and the boys' program is both that if we don't address it in treatment, it, it, treatment just doesn't go as far, nearly as far. Um, but uh, addressing it is almost never, it's, since it's almost never a perpetrating parent, um, the parents need to be validated because they often, you know, let's say it was a, a former boyfriend or you know, a friend of an older brother um, or an older sibling. You know, there are a lot of things that this comes out. Uh, th those all have different clinical implications, but they, has, they have to be addressed, of course. But that doesn't really show up here because the perpetrating parent isn't part of these data. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, just to address all Lorna's points since we had a little bit of this conversation last night. This always also points to the importance of understanding where uh, what your referral site is. So from mm -hmm. here, your study, those are all self-referring parents yeah. that are going on, so they're not going they, to be right. the ones right. that perpetrate. And you know, a lot of my work is on the inpatient unit. We do Absolutely. see quite a bit of parent perpetrators. Right. They're not going to be the ones that show up. You know, in, a, in a residential program. No. Or, well, this was or, a, well, this, these data were from a different place. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, most of them uh, actually Medicare kids. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Below SES. Okay. Yeah. Is there any data from family connections or, or the trainings about the importance of booster sessions after this intensive training? Is it necessary or not, really? <laughs> no data. Who such else? a great question. That was uh, actually parents. That was the biggest feedback that we got from parents after this uh, was 
please give us a please give us a booster um, or where can we follow up and what we did was refer them out to a f to family connections in, in you know when it was available in their area but Great. yeah and what we have found in the groups that are running across the country is that they'll do their own support groups afterwards. Mm -hmm. They'll form some sort of little community for themselves. Yes. Sometimes with the leaders, they'll stay on with them or they'll mm -hmm. merge some groups together. But they, we haven't been able to keep up with the demand for family connections sure. to then or for more than that. But that is a goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The parents often ask if they could come again for a second and weekend, uh, do it again. In fact, that's the... That, that's really the closest thing to an answer for the data is that people do come back for a second round mm -hmm. uh, and they report um, good outcomes. Um, although the, the, the longer term outcomes are pretty good even without that. So it's. I want to also say that mostly, I mean, with Lucy's study, it was um, professionals running the group, but mostly out in the community, it's family members and they get trained, they come in on their own dime across the country to come for the weekend to have either Alan or Marie, uh, Paul and Lucy train them to do the course and bring it back to their home location. So, you know, sometimes they get their own boostering by becoming leaders and offering it back to other people. Okay. Well, thanks so much for mm -hmm. joining us. And, uh,